this Sunday is the baptism of our Lord, uh, in which we also are reminded of our own baptisms. Um, and so I, let, we'll start with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day, you revealed your son to the nations by the leading of a star. Lead us now by faith to know your presence in our lives and bring us at last to the full vision of your glory through your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 All right. So um, even though we're in baptism of our Lord, we continue in the season of Epiphany. Um, and so in the whole month of January, we have texts uh, about light, about God being revealed, about God being accessible to the whole world. Um, and so that is uh, enjoyable. Um, and <laughs> my off day continues because I just did the prayer of the day for Epiphany. I want to read you the text uh, of the prayer of the day for, for baptism mm -hmm. of our Lord. You did the prayer for Epiphany. Uh -oh. <laughs> I want to do the, the prayer of baptism for our Lord because it, um, listen for themes in this uh, because it, it does kind of capture the themes for the Sunday. We'll pray again. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. There are themes in there of light, uh, of goodness, of God's word making us new and giving light, uh, of God's spirit transforming us. So, I will pull up on the screen here. Yeah? Can you see the gospel in front of you? Yes. Good. Thank you. All right. So this is this Sunday's gospel, Mark chapter one. And uh, remember that we are in year B in the lectionary. That's the calendar of readings that we share with the greater church, other denominations in the United States. Um, and so this is my sound for now. This is uh, Mark one. Um, Chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Back to the gospel of our Lord. So first, a couple words about John, and then we'll go to Jesus' baptism and how it connects with us. Um, and then I'll open it for up for your comments and questions. Um, all right. So uh, we looked at John actually uh, during Advent, too, because he, as he prepares the way for people to repent, he also, his words help us to prepare our hearts to recognize Jesus. Um, but I, and I know we've talked about this before, but I'll just highlight once again um, that John's clothing is significant. Um, his, uh, his dress and also what he eats, the locusts and wild honey, um, and the fact that he drinks no alcohol, all of these are um, signs that he is set apart by God, that he's a servant of God, and especially that he is like Elijah, the great prophet in the Old Testament. His story is told, um, especially in Book of uh, First Kings and Second Kings, um, that, um, and also First and Second Samuel, um, that he is like Elijah reincarnated, which 
was is also a fulfillment of prophecy of the prophecy that uh, Elijah would come again before the Messiah, and so John fulfills that prophecy. And um, and then the fact that like what he eats also, and that he doesn't consume alcohol, it sets him apart, so that um, it's less likely for people to call. Uh, I guess to maybe essentially, I can't think of a nicer way to say this, but to dismiss him um, by saying that like he's intoxicated and so that he has more, more legitimacy this way. Um, and he's very much aware of his place that uh, I mean, he gets, uh, I sort of, we get the impression from the gospels that he gets, a, um, but he has sort of a crowd he has disciples of his own. So he's causing up his own story. Um, part of the reason why he is arrested. Um, and, but he, he is aware of his position that Jesus is greater than himself. Um, and the baptized, you can think of like being immersed or covered or drenched in, uh, and that and he says that it, that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So drench us with the Holy Spirit, cover us with the Holy Spirit, immerse us in the Holy Spirit. And, and that does become, uh, become true, especially in the book of Acts. Uh, so when he sends his Holy Spirit, Onto the church. And now to the baptism of Jesus. Um, okay, so just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart here in verse 10, and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. I wanted to highlight because this word here, the Greek for torn apart, um, is found here, and then at the very end of the Gospel of Mark, it happens at the exact moment, too, when um, the, like that word, after Jesus is crucified and when he breathes his last and he dies, then the temple curtains are, his demise. They're, they're torn apart from top to bottom, so symbolically that God initiates the removal of any more barriers between um, humans and God. That he has, uh, that he has, I guess, bridged that separation and that gap, and so that we're, um, that now we can be together. That God is not far off, um, and that it's God who has initiated this. And so the same word is here. And so we see at the very beginning of his public ministry, and at the very end of his uh, life uh, before the resurrection, that there is this tearing apart, where it's like the full presence of God comes. Uh, present, I guess, with those who are with Jesus, because he is God. Um, and so uh, I guess that is to be encouraging to us, um, that it is in, in Jesus Christ that the full power of God is. Um, and uh, so, like, and at, like, and at, especially at his crucifixion, when, like, a moment when his disciples and others who trust in him might think it's, like, the worst moment is actually when God's full power is seen in a in a place of weakness where we least expect um and then jesus also gets this promise from god the father you are my son the beloved with you i am well pleased um jesus needs to hear this i think because in the very next section he um it's the temptation in the wilderness um and so before he goes uh, into to deal with that i think he needs to hear and um, be reminded and just have this promise given to him that he is the, he is the son of God. And so that um, he can cling to that when he feels alone in the desert. So. I think uh, in the past, somebody asked a really great question. It, I think it was probably you, Linda, when we've looked at this passage before, uh, which was, uh, why does Jesus need to be baptized when he never sinned? If baptism is for the forgiveness of sin, um, like why, why does that need to happen? Um, and, um, so I think that that is a helpful question. I'll start out by suggesting a couple of things. I'm going to stop it so that you can see each other at least instead of just the text. Um, so a couple of things I want to suggest, like why would Jesus need to be baptized? Um, one reason is that as like fully human, um, Jesus is for us. He like he shows us the way to true life, uh, and so um, I guess like everything that happens to him, everything that is promised to him, 
and everything that he experienced, um, we like also share in. Um, so he warns us that we will share in his sufferings, that others will persecute us because of our faith. Um, but we will also share in his inheritance of eternal life and ruling in the kingdom of God forever. Um, and so part of it is that everything that Jesus does and has, like we share in. And so him being baptized also shows us to be baptized as well. Um, but all, a second reason I'll say is that baptism isn't, is not just for the forgiveness of sins. Yes, it is like God does promise to forgive us our sins. But the other thing that happens is we are given the Holy Spirit and then we are commissioned. Um, like we're, our baptismal calling then is to share the faith after that moment. And so the, he gets baptized as sort of the inauguration of his public ministry. It's like, um, uh, I don't know, when you start a new job, it's like your, your new job orientation. Um, or uh, as a pastor, it's like when a pastor is installed in a congregation um, or a deacon or deaconess, um, it's like the, the, the formal start uh, of his public ministry. And so it, it starts in this way. Um, and also to connect him with John the Baptist and the Old Testament. So I'll stop there and then see what your thoughts are if you have questions or observations. I had a question about, it seems like we, we, do we do this uh, scripture more than once a year? <laughs> because it's so familiar to me, like we've done it recently. Does that, or does the only time it comes up is now in the church calendar? You're right. It does come up multiple times. Like we, so here at John the Baptist, um, in Advent always, it's like, I think it's the second or third Sunday, sometimes both in Advent. Uh, then we hear of him on uh, the baptism of our Lord, often when Jesus is baptized. Um, and then we also hear, maybe not like the baptism of Jesus, but we hear from John the Baptist also in the summer sometimes. Um, because like uh, the summer, the theme is green. And so we're growing in faith and his words are meant to help us know how we're supposed to live as Christians. So yeah, we get him a lot. So your observation is correct. Yeah. So I feel like it's, I mean, it, it doesn't leave open many questions since we've talked about it, for me anyway. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, I was a little shocked that we uh, moved straight from uh, birth to baptism <laughs> 20 years apart. <laughs> Nothing That's makes so sense true. about the calendar to me. Yeah. <laughs> the calendar. Yeah. And like I was expecting, you know, maybe the um, getting left behind at the temple reading or one of the other like little kid stories, but straight on to adulthood. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is that is sort of shocking. We spend an interesting. Well, the God, neither the gospel writers nor we in our worship spend a lot of time on him until his public ministry. So, <laughs> you know, right, we just, we skip right to it. Yeah, basically the only things that really do make sense are at Christmas, we do hear the birth story, and at Easter, we do hear the death story. And then sort of all the rest of it is uh, put in around that. So, but in the Gospel of Mark, maybe uh, it is that sudden, because Mark doesn't even tell us how Jesus is born. Like we have the stories of, we have the story of Jesus in the manger um, from Luke, and we have the story of the Magi visiting from Matthew. So Mark doesn't even think it's important to tell us how he was born. He just tells us about his adult life. So it is that sudden in the gospel. One little question that occurs to me, um, and I don't know the answer to this one, so I'm going to ask it. Um, John's baptized. Why? Uh, I don't see any references in the Old Testament to any of the prophets baptizing or any Jewish uh, Jewish uh, uh, traditions of baptizing. You know, so did John just sort of invent this and everybody knew what it meant? Or, I mean, there's the obvious reference to cleansing, you know, but 
Um, it just seems it's always seemed odd to me that all of a sudden we got this guy out there in the wilderness pouring water over people, baptize them. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it also feels it also feels strange, especially because like we celebrate in baptism that we are united in Christ's death and resurrection, and he has not died and been resurrected yet when John is baptizing people. So you're right, that does seem strange. Um, I don't have there isn't like um biblical evidence of this. But I, I guess I learned in seminary that um, that there were some sects of Judaism that were pra- practicing baptism. It might have been the Essene, like the Essene community that lived outside of Jerusalem. But I, I'm not positive about that. But I do recall that there were like that there were Jewish communities that were practicing baptism as a ritual before John the Baptist. So he isn't the one to invent it, according to what I learned in seminary. But I. I realize that's not very helpful exactly because at this moment I can't quote to you exactly where that is from. That's helpful actually because that's the first I've heard of that. Um, the uh, how do they spell a scenes? E S S E N E S. Oh, E. Okay. I also wonder, I wonder if Josephus, who is a, a Jewish historian, I wonder if he wrote this um, I don't recall. I read, I read his histories. I don't recall, but it has been a while. I don't have a, a, a eidetic memory or anything like that. Okay, so I'm looking here at the scenes. Let's see. I was going to look up um, nope okay well let us know if you find anything Carol while you're looking um, so I'm not able to like actually quote a section from you but so I think that the reason it has meaning for people there is because they, they've been familiar with it um, yeah. that's but, my point if they didn't know what it was it wouldn't have any meaning right Right, so they have been familiar with it. Apparently, like though it was it was a practice of like a ritual of of cleansing, um, of of repentance, of starting over. So, but you've given me a clue. <laughs> yeah, Mark is also the Gospel of Mark. It's in chapter eight um, when uh, James and John are arguing, and they want like they ask for, <laughs> about who's the greatest, and then they ask Jesus to put them on both sides of him when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus asks him, like, are you able to be, like, you don't know what you're asking. And they're like, yeah, we do. And he's like, if uh, you um, ask for my baptism, you will be baptized in my baptism. But as to who will sit on my right and my left, that's not my authority to give. And so there, that's like another indication that the baptism, which Jesus is baptized, is is his calling, um, like what he is called into. Actually, you're right. It is the scenes. Okay. There was there. They did have a tradition, an annual tradition, a yearly renewal ceremony that involved baptism. Okay. Ritual immersion played a significant role in the religious practice of Jews in the Second Temple period. So, okay. Well, that explains that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No. Thank you. I'm really glad you asked that question. It was great. Good. All right. Well, um, let's also go and look at um, mm-hmm. uh, some of the other passages. We'll read uh, the Old Testament and then the New Testament left, and they're both very short. I'll share my screen here. There we go. All right. Carol, do you mind reading for us just this one? Don't mind at all. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. One, thank you, Carol. One may ask, 
well, why do we have this passage on baptism of our Lord? Um, because the those who put this the lectionary together are seeking to help us see the Holy Spirit throughout the whole of Scripture. So as Christians, when we read one passage, we also read it sort of in communication uh, or in light of, like we have in the back of our minds, all other Scripture passages. So that. What the like? What we're doing then, as Christians, when we hear all these passages on Sunday morning, is while we hear the gospel and that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove, we also are to think of Genesis one, and that the whole here it's the wind of God. But you'll note there is a note B here, which is down here, while the Spirit of God or a mighty wind. So you can translate this: a wind from God or the Spirit of God or a mighty wind swept over the face of the the waters. Um, and so like the sense here though, is that it is, it comes from God and it is the Holy Spirit. Um, so then uh, now I, I just to a disclaimer that this is not how, um, how Jewish people would read this passage. I, I'm giving you a Christian interpretation to, uh, to invite us to see that the Trinity is eternal uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always have been. Um, so that um, it's just like at Jesus' birth, he becomes incarnate, that he, he comes to us so that we can see and know God, but that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been. And that the Holy Spirit isn't created at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit always has been. It's just at Pentecost, God shares his own spirit with us and pours that spirit into our hearts. Um, or, well, to the early church's hearts. But then we get it in um, baptism, as you'll see in the New Testament reading. So the reason that we have... Um, hold on one second. Okay. I guess you can't see my screen, obviously, because my video's not working, but Henry came in. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, but the reason we have Genesis 1 on the baptism of our Lord is so that we can see from the very beginning of the scripture we're given that the Holy Spirit is present and that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit create together. So, Okay, another reason could be that the baptism of, of Jesus is considered to be the beginning of his uh, public ministry. Yes. The beginning of, uh, well, the beginning of the Bible, really. I mean, it's the beginning of everything. Right, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of the beginning. That's very, yeah, that's helpful. Um, you're right. And thank you for bringing that up because I, I really think that Mark has that in mind when he starts out the gospel because um, the first one is in the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, so you're right. He does want us to hear that. So thank you for bringing that up, Carol, that Mark wants us to hear the connection between the beginning of scripture and the beginning of the gospel that he's telling us to say that there is consistency here between Jesus and um, and Yahweh, or uh, the, the God of the Old Testament, because he is God. So, thank you for that. Good. Does anybody else see any other links? We just lost your sound. Oh. There you go. You're back. Okay. You just got real muffled, like you moved away from it. Did you hear the part that I said, all my affirmations of your point? Yes. Okay. Just so my question, off. <laughs> okay, then my question was, do, do, does anybody else see any other connections? Okay, so let's look at the New Testament. Um, so this is Acts 19. Um, I see the subtitle here. Paul is in Ephesus, so he's in the city. Um, Ephesus then becomes the place... Um, that he like the Christians that he like, the people he introduced to Jesus there, then they are the Ephesians. So when we read the letter to the Ephesians, he's writing to these Christians. Um, Linda, do you want to read for us? I'm goofing off here. Okay. Uh oh. I think you and uh, Jeannie are feeding back to each other. I got. Wait a minute. I'll fix it. Hold on. That happens to Sydney and me when we're both in the same room, uh, but on different devices. Okay, yes, yes. Yeah, I muted her. I, I had her muted. I didn't have it on. Okay, anyway, I'm ready. What am I now? What am I supposed to read? One through seven? Uh, yep, one through seven, please. 
Okay. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into Jordan's into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Thank you, Linda. Okay, an important point of clarification. In verse 1, when they say that Paul found some disciples, he doesn't mean like the original 12. That's, so that's not referring to um, like the 12 who were at the Last Supper or who followed around Jesus around for three years. Disciple is somebody, is like a, is a student so or a follower. So these are people who know about Jesus and who follow him. So they're, they're believers, like they believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's just that we discover that they were, they like the, when they were baptized, somebody baptized them into John. That is John the Baptist. Um, and so Paul here does <laughs> sort of like a, a doctrinal teaching uh, and um, says that they're supposed to be baptized into Jesus, which is when we baptize people, we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that there is consistency, so that all Christians can say that, which comes from Matthew's gospel. At the very end, Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission. Um, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The reason that we do it that way is because it comes from Scripture, um, as of much of our worship practices do. And um, so it seems that this particular group of Christians were not baptized this way. And interestingly enough, um, this text, suggests to us that they don't have the Holy Spirit until after they are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because of verse 6. When Paul had laid his hands on them, um, then the Holy Spirit came upon them. So there is, I guess, importance here in being baptized first in the name of Jesus, just like he taught us, according to Matthew. Um, And second, the laying on of hands and praying for the Holy Spirit to come which both of those are part of our baptismal rite. Again, we do it because it comes from Scripture. So that after we say, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, then we put the oil on the person's head in the shape of the cross and say, you've been baptized. Um, or, let's see. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked to the cross of Christ forever. And then we put, then the pastor puts their hands on the person and prays over them Um for the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in his presence now and forever, um, which comes from an Old Testament passage that I can't give you the reference for at the moment, um, off the top of my head. But anyway, it's also consistent between Old Testament and New. So I blather on, but my last point is to say, um, Two, I think this is significant uh, to many Christians, the laying on of hands from an apostle. And actually, um, in early 2000s, when we be- when the ELCA became full um, communion partners, which means we can share communion, we can share pastors, that we agree on so much doctrine that we believe that, um, or that we feel comfortable uh, in full communion, I guess, to the I guess the most unity is possible without giving up our denominations um, with the Episcopal Church. Um, that that was something that we uh, that we agreed to is that from then on, like all of our all of our bishops would uh, could would be able then to trace them. I guess their calling or their um, ordination back to the apostles because um, the Episcopal Church. Uh, can trace it. And so um, I just I wanted to share that with you as a bit of history, a recent history in the church. So I'll stop there. Questions or things that you observe about this story?
Did I lose you all? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're just staying <laughs> muted. <laughs> you all are. Okay, good. You're here. I guess it's interesting that, that they don't know who the Holy Spirit is before Paul tells them. And um, like the Holy Spirit is actually like, is one of the greatest joys of being a Christian. It's that you have the presence of God with you, that you are promised that, I guess that is the, that's what uh, Paul calls the down payment of the promise is that you have God's presence with you, um, that you can, it is the Holy Spirit that helps you to have faith. It is the Holy Spirit that encourages you when you're down. It's the Holy Spirit that makes a particular scripture passage or hymn or song or like part of a sermon reach your heart and give you what you need on a particular day. So um, it's the Holy Spirit that does all of that. Well, the Holy Spirit wasn't, uh, I don't believe, a part of uh, any Jewish uh, beliefs that they would have been, that they would be familiar with. The Holy Spirit was somewhat of a new concept, I think. So as far as that, in this, like as a, in a, how we think about it, like personhood. Um, I mean, they would talk about the spirit, but uh, but as a specific uh, part of the triune God, they you know they, they didn't have that. I, I, that's consistent with what I think. Uh, Addie, I don't, I, I, if, if you want to name anything that you know from your personal experience about that, would you say that's accurate? Or yeah, I, I'd say so. Um, I, I haven't had that conversation specifically, but I know that like um, there's a lot less emphasis on personification of God in general in Judaism. Um, of like, there was, uh, this is, I promise this is related. So we, uh, <laughs> we were driving down the highway recently and one of the billboards, like, um, between here and Athens. So, you know, pretty rural Ohio, uh, quoted one of the, um, verses in Corinthians about, um, basically, you know, if you do good works, you get to, uh, or, um, Heaven will be granted to you if you, like, do good works and seek the face of God. And I, would like, looked it up to see which verse they were referring, and I read that, and he's like, we don't have a concept for that at all. You're not supposed to seek God's face. Like, God doesn't have a face. So I think that's pretty consistent with, uh, with that and, like, the concept of, like, separating the two. Yeah, that did relate greatly, and that's very helpful. Thank you. In some ways, I guess I'm thinking about that, like more of the Jewish concept of not personifying God. God, uh, I guess like on the one side, I'm thinking that seems much holier or set apart or mysterious, like so that God, I think that would prevent, like that's why you can't make idols, um, like why they weren't supposed to so often in the, um, in the laws that it's emphasized that you're not supposed to make idols or any graven images of God because inevitably it falls short and then you worship that thing, which is not God. Um, and so anyway, it seems more holy in that aspect that God can't just be limited or that we can't, that we don't think of God sort of like in the mythological concepts of gods where they're very jealous and they're having affairs with human beings, et cetera, et cetera, that, that the God uh, of the Old Testament is very different than all of that. Um, but then at the same time, I also want to say I'm thankful that, that Christ like came so that we do have a face, or it, so that God is not so mysterious and unknowable. That's just my own personal reaction that I felt like sharing. <laughs> so, um, maybe we can spend a couple minutes on talking about like what is it that the Holy Spirit does according to these passages that we can, and then I uh, want to go back to like, what does all of this mean for our, our baptism? Um, all right. So thank you, Carol. And thank you, Addy, for, uh, for your, your thoughts and for what you shared about what you know, and that that is helpful to us. Um, oh, where was I? Mark one. 
Okay. So here in verse, so in the gospel, verse 10, and just as he was coming out of uh, the water, he saw the heavens turn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. If it wasn't obvious, it's verses like these and also in Luke and Matthew, which is why so often the Holy Spirit is depicted as a, like as a bird or as a dove. Um, almost like here too, Mark seems to make God visible for us. Um, or like the separateness of the Trinity and yet the unity. Um, anywho, uh, okay, so the Spirit descends, or it's like the Spirit comes from God to us uh, and fills us up. And then when that happens, then in verse 11, he hears the, father, the Father's voice, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So those connections between 10 verse 10 and 11 show us what the Holy Spirit does. One thing is that the Holy Spirit helps us hear the voice of God. Martin Luther says that we cannot, uh, on our own understanding, come to Jesus Christ or believe in him. It's the Holy Spirit that calls us through scripture and gives and helps us to believe in Jesus. So that's one thing, this connection between verse 10 and 11. The Spirit comes and then Jesus hears the voice of God. So we have the Holy Spirit so that we can hear and understand and recognize the voice of God. Did uh, Jesus ever talk directly to God before this passage? In the Gospel of Mark, that's a good question. Let's see. Look, I don't think so. I think I mean, it's just only four verses before this one, I guess. Why? Not. Uh... I don't believe that he that there is anything before this as far as his public ministry goes. Yeah, I was thinking like of the times because he there's plenty of them in the other gospels that he talks to God, but I don't know if it was before this or not. Well, the, in the, uh, the one you mentioned earlier about the uh, uh, temple when uh, the young Christ was uh, young Jesus was in the temple and speaking with the uh, the wise people there that were there and so forth. Uh, you know, he said, "I do not know. I have to go about my father's business." Uh, so there's a reference to it, but not directly. I don't think I could be wrong, but I don't think there's anything. If you put it in chronological order, I don't think there's any time that's recorded before this event. Yeah. Yes, I think that's accurate. I think what you're both saying is accurate that there there is no specific like quoted prayer in the Gospels until after um, after he's baptized, uh, and yet there are allusions to the fact that he has a relationship with God the Father before it. So still, I think you can say both things. You can say, you know, it's likely he did pray before that moment. Um, and yet, at the same time, it is true, I think, like your point, Addy, that the Holy Spirit gives us access to God, right? That when we have the Holy Spirit, we have a direct connection to God. And that, that, is, that, that is part of the, that is the great blessing of the Holy Spirit. Now, in one of the non-canonical Gospels where, uh, and I'm not sure the name of it, but it's basically the story of Christ and the child, um, the answer would be different there. But uh, you know that's not accepted as part of the as part of the uh, canon. Um, but it was stories that were floating around back in the early centuries. Yes. Did uh, did I did I seem to capture your point, Addie? Or did you yeah. want to say more about that? About like the no. fact that no, the direct. Okay. Um. All right, thank you both again. Then here's Genesis 1. So here, pretty plainly, it's the Holy Spirit. Um, it's, it is once again sort of like language, like a bird or like wind. And Jesus also refers to the Spirit as wind um, because he says um, like the, the Spirit of God is, is like the wind. You don't see where it comes or, or where it goes, but you see its branches, like, but you see the, the branches moving in it. Um, and so that's also like, I guess, imagery consistent throughout scripture. Like, so as to say, you can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes, but you can see the evidence of the Holy Spirit's working in um, like the changes or the effect it has in the world. Um, and so then here too, the Holy Spirit is a part of creation. Um, 
So you may notice that, I don't know, maybe in other congregations in your life, you may, uh, people may refer to God, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Uh, I think that that language is to help us understand what God does. But technically speaking, um, we, you, you can't divide the work of God. Like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always, are all together created, all together redeemed humanity, all together sustain us in faith and life. Um, that's a, just a technicality <laughs> according to Lutheran doctrine that I thought I would bring up here. <laughs> so, um, and then last, Acts 19. Um, okay, so these people, they, they do, like their disciples, they want to follow Jesus, um, but they don't know who the Holy Spirit is yet um, until Paul said, baptizes them in the name of Jesus. So there is a, there's a link between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Like when you're baptized in Jesus, then you get the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, what else are we going to say? And that the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, too, uh, in, according to um, the book of Acts. Um, and then, lastly, uh, once they have the Holy Spirit, then they speak in tongues and prophesy. So I think that those speaking in tongues or in different language and prophesying, um, that is speaking for God, um, saying the word of God, not necessarily predicting the future, but speaking for God is what prophecy is. Um, that, like that those gifts come from the Holy Spirit too. Uh, and I think that like, I guess, cause it's, it's evidence of something outside of ourselves, something that we couldn't do before. Um, we can do now because of God working in us, something that we can't be explained any other way, except that all of a sudden it began because they received the Holy Spirit. So, and that's not to say like, if you like the fact that we can't speak in tongues or that we haven't prophesied doesn't mean we don't have the Holy Spirit. Um, it's just in scripture, it's the often um, of it. Um, scripture also says that the Holy Spirit gives many, many gifts. So we just aren't gifted with speaking in tongues. <laughs> Each of us have different gifts than that. So I think I'll stop there. Did that generate any thoughts or questions too? About the Spirit? Go ahead. No, I'm done, Linda. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just, uh, you know, I have trouble with the Trinity thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, trying. we all do. Yes. It's a difficult concept. <laughs> I'm trying. So I can, but so the, what occurred, the question that came up in my mind this time was what's, I mean, I love the Holy Spirit, but what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit if, if, um, if it isn't separate from God? If it is God? What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? If it's well, I, I think I feel like the Holy Spirit is is something that that's it's how God gets the mess his work done. That it's you know God didn't descend, or did God descend from the cloud as a dove? You know, or was it the Holy Spirit? Or it was you know if the Holy Spirit is God, then was it really God? I don't know. It's like, why do you need the Holy Spirit if they're all one? Other than, I, I like the way the Holy Spirit works because it just kind of, it comes over you and you can't imagine a, well, a being. And of course, I visualize God as a human being and Jesus with his beard and long hair and all that kind of stuff. Does he have blue eyes? <laughs> huh? I don't know. I really don't know, does he? <laughs> blue eyes? I don't know. Probably. Speaking, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. But there's often depicted that way. But yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Blue eyes are not that common in the Middle East. Let's <laughs> 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 uh, You know, just kind of before you answer, Pastor, if I can just sort of supplement something that, that Linda said and add to the question, if you will. Uh, I've always felt that the concept of the triune God of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was more of a way for humans to understand the different aspects, the different functions that are all in one, one, one being, if you will, is, is performing all these functions. But 
it, it, they have different manifestations. Uh, you have the father's manifestation as one of a father, the, 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 the guy who guided the Jews through the, the Hebrews through the, the desert and everything else. And the son is, you know, more of a brother to us. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a human being. It's a, we see that, yes, uh, this is the, 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 this, uh, uh, we, have, we have something in common here. We have something uh, with, with him. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is more of an explanation of the other acts that take place that we don't really know how to explain. Sort of like, you know, we, we can't see um, atoms, but yet we can, we can model it. We can, we can say, yes, there's, this action takes place. Something must be doing it. This is an explanation for it. And the Spirit is our explanation for it. It's the way I've always looked at it, right or wrong. And I don't know how, you know, I'm not talking as a theologian. I'm just talking as an individual. Yeah, I think that that's helpful, especially what you said about it's the same being. And that's part of the Nicene Creed of one being with the Father. Um, That, yes, there is only one God. And we know God because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. (laughs) <laughs> like so I guess that's the part about the manifestation and is like, the reason we use this language is because it's the language of the Bible the reason we use this language is because it's the language of Jesus um, because he speaks of the comforter and the Holy Spirit coming upon his people and because he prays to God the Father he doesn't pray to himself he has a relationship with God the Father and so um, the reason we use the language is because it's given to us by Jesus and scripture. And yet, yes, you're right. It is one being, only one God. Um, and I, I'm going to, I've never, I don't think I've ever explained it in this way, but we'll see it, how, what you think. So Jim Miller, Linda's Jim, um, and often in men's Bible study, he'll say like that he finds comfort in mystery, like that there are some things that cannot be explained because uh, it's just another um, like reminder that God is infinite and we are finite, that, uh, that there is more to God than just like what we can understand. And I was thinking that like the concept of three and one and one and three, just it is inherently difficult um, for us. And I always get nervous about Holy Trinity Sunday, Sunday when it comes. In June, because I'm like, oh, we're gonna explain it this time and not conspiracy. Because it's sort of like whenever you talk about God, you just it, the language falls short. And no matter how I try to say it, it, it is technically a heresy, which is like a false teaching. That it's um, and so like I don't know. I think one one time we did a children's sermon about how God was like a popsicle, and I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> Once. I can't believe I did that, but um, you guys are all so patient. But like, even like, that's not entirely. I don't know. That's it's none of it is actually fully expresses what Trinity is, um, except for the language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit itself. And that uh, I just wonder if God gives us just enough so that we can know Him, but still challenges us just to say, yeah, there is. I am God, and you, and they're just you won't be able to understand everything. Um, but I will say, just to to circle back to what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Um, the Holy Spirit is God's spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus uh, come to us, so that we know who God is. So the purpose of the Spirit is so that we may know Jesus and hear God's word. And want a relationship with God. I don't know. Does that help? I like, I, I, yeah, it does, does actually. Like, I like that. Does it feel like a cop out, though? No, no. Actually, I was able to feel it. So, just like I feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I thought, oh, is that what it is? It's his, uh, whatever part of that being that it's it's not something you can touch but it's something you can feel or know which is the only way we're we're going to be touched 
Yeah, and I don't I don't mean like that God reveals it just to be tricky or like, haha, I'm so much smarter than you, you dummies. Um, I, I mean it more like just as a, a piece of revelation to us, a hint in God's own language for God's self that even in how God has revealed himself to us, we still can't God completely God. I think, um, I think Addie, before we had talked about that question, I saw you moving to maybe also have a comment or some thought. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't have to get into it super deep, but I, what struck me this whole time and this just kind of brewing, now I'm worried about the early church <laughs> of like, if the, if there was a part of the early church that didn't know the Holy Spirit, like, what other parts of the early church just were so discombobulated that didn't know things? And when did we smooth it out? And did we ever smooth it out? <laughs> so that that's going to be stuck in my head for a while. Well, that's why the Nicene Council, Council was held. That was the first attempt to smooth it out, if you will, because there were so many different sects of, uh, of Christians. Um, there were those who believed that uh, Jesus was all man and those that believe that jesus was all god and those that believe that jesus was god and man and a lot of other different concepts floating around um see how well that worked out for us didn't it <laughs> <laughs> true, true true but at the time it had a unifying factor uh, it was a unifying thing that you know but it only happened because the roman emperor called it you know so But yeah, it's you're right. It, it was it was a lot of different concepts. And there's still some like the Coptic Church. The Coptic Church is as old as any any Christian church, uh, and and they have a lot of different ideas about the same things that we have. They just interpret them differently. Uh, I don't know what they are. I'm not an expert in the Coptic Church. Um, I like their crosses; they're very ornate. <laughs> but uh, uh, Jennifer, wow. Um, is that you, Jennifer West, or is that you, Jennifer Pence? Jennifer is joining. Was it Jennifer Juniper? Uh, <laughs> what? Jennifer Juniper. Yeah. Donovan song. <laughs> That's oh, it. That's hello. It. Well, oh, there welcome. It <laughs> there it is. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, there right. I am. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm Hi. Right. No, that's okay. We're, we're glad that you're here. Um, and so uh, what, you can go ahead and continue what you were going to say, Carol. Lost my train of thought now. No, I, <laughs> but I was just saying, I was just saying what, uh, uh, what uh, affirming what, what uh, Addie had suggested there is that in the early church, there were a lot of different interpretations of what the message was. Um, and it really wasn't any attempt made to unify them until the, the, the Council of Nicaea. Um, which is where the Nicene Creed comes from. And it's a definition. This is what, if you're Christian, then this is what you believe, basically what, what it said. Yeah, I think, um, I know we may not have to get into it, but I sort of just want to do a little bit of reassurance. <laughs> um, you know, I guess, and earlier, Carol mentioned, like, you know, that there are Gospels that are not included in our canon. Um, and I think, I guess, I my opinion of that is because the Holy Spirit was at work in that process. And it was like, it was the Gospels and it was the letters that were read in churches um, consistently that became, that were part of the canon and that the others were let go of. Because like when people read them, they did not hear Jesus speaking to them. They did not feel God drawing them closer. They did not... Um, like they weren't kindled in faith. They weren't, they didn't feel inspired, I guess, to serve or to work for the Lord. And so I think that the Holy Spirit, like who we're talking about today, has a big hand in that canon. I'm not saying it was a perfect process or without human involvement or politics or anything like that. I'm just saying that I think the Holy Spirit is always at work. So even when the early church, if and however it was that they made mistakes or misunderstood, um, just like we make mistakes and misunderstand things today, 
Um, and that like the world and the news and our families and friends are all full of examples of people who think that they alone have the right understanding of God. And, a, and, and yet the Holy Spirit keeps addressing us and talking to us in every age um, and correcting us and drawing us closer to God. So it's okay if it wasn't right or perfect. Um, is that, an, is that enough for now, Addie? For sure. <laughs> um, so the last thing I want to say about today is, uh, the baptism that when Jesus is baptized, like the same thing he says to, or that God, the father says to Jesus, he says, to me. um, and so in our gospel, God, the father said, you are my son, the beloved with you, I'm well pleased. And that is what God says to each of you in your baptism, that you are God's beloved child, and with you, God is well pleased. So, on that note, we can move toward prayer. Um, I'm wondering if I can break down your prayer requests today for us to pray together. Um, we'll pray for Janet King. She is not here with us because she and Dennis are on the road to Florida. Chelsea texted me that she's doing well, but she was having physical therapy, so couldn't be with us. Um, I, I want to ask us to pray. Some of you, uh, you might remember Pastor Ryan Pranzinski, um, who's joined us a couple times. And he's not with us today because actually a member in his congregation, their, their well, one-year-old died from COVID today. So um, he is with them at this time. So... I think that we should pray for that family and for Pastor Ryan in that. Um, what else is, who else is on your hearts and minds that we should pray for? Um, my, my neighbor Vicki is in a very difficult personal situation. If we could pray for her, that would be, that would be very nice. Okay, okay. absolutely. My, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are both have uh, COVID right now, both having they're both still at home, but they're having mild symptoms. Uh, the uh, uh, and my uh, close friend of mine, his wife and his son uh, have COVID and are isolated in a uh, hospital in a uh, hotel because the hospital didn't have space for them, and they're being visited there by nurses and so forth. Um, that's up in up in uh, Wisconsin, uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough tough world out there right now with the COVID situation. Do you want us to pray for any of them by name, Carol, or just well, the name, relationship? Name would be would be Tammy and Benjamin. Tammy and who? Benjamin. It's Jewish. Benjamin. Benjamin. We call it Benjamin, but they pronounce it. He's his name is Benjamin. Okay. Got I got it. in trouble once for calling Ben. <laughs> And then, and then, who your brother-in-law and sister-in-law? Uh, Roger and Sue. Roger and Sue. Cindy, Cindy's brother and, and wife. Yes. Okay, I got them down. Others of you, Linda, how's your brother Dick doing? He 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 seems to be getting better. Uh, oh, slowly, just a little bit at a time. But um, anyway. Cautiously optimistic, I can say that. Thank you. Definitely he could use some prayers for continued recovery, that's for sure. Okay. All right. The Lord be with you. Also, also with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for sending your spirit upon us and you, this Bible study today, for gathering us together and for making the word to one another for our sakes. We pray, Lord, for those who are on our hearts today, especially for Janet and Dennis as they travel. Get them to Florida safely. For Chelsea, we ask that uh, this physical therapy may increase her strength. Uh, we pray for Pastor Ryan and for the family uh, who is facing the death of their little one and uh, who is now in heaven with you. We ask that you give Pastor Ryan words of comfort, that you send your Holy Spirit upon all of them to speak what he needs to speak. 
uh, so that they may feel your presence with him, them and that they may trust that uh, their child is with you, uh, that you would bring healing in your good timing. Uh, we pray for Jennifer's neighbor, Vicki, um, and what she is going through, that you would bring her out of this difficult per, uh, situation, um, that you would uh, give her comfort, uh, help her to have peace, okay. give her wisdom to make good decisions, and bring her to the other side of this. We pray, Lord, for Roger and Sue, for Tammy and Benjamin, that you would heal them all, that you would treat them of COVID, and that you would go well. We pray also for Dick, and thank you for the recovery he has made so far, and ask that you continue to heal him. Lord, all of these things, and whatever else you know that we need, we do ask in Jesus' name and trust that as you sent him to us, that he is with us all. May your spirit help us to hear your voice, to follow Christ this week, uh, and to see your creative power in all circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.